to the, the lecture. I know it's kind of short notice. And for those of you who came just because there was free pizza, thank you for coming as well. I hope you find this somewhat interesting to go along with your free food, because I know when I was in med school, we showed up to any lecture that was all something to eat. So when I asked what you guys would probably be most interested in hearing, I got a lot about the zebra procedures, the procedures that we as emergency medicine physicians will see maybe once or twice in our lifetime. And several of these I haven't seen or have only seen once. So these definitely follow under that kind of criteria. So one thing you probably, guys will probably hear as you get into your clinical years and go into residency, you're going to hear a lot of quotes like this. When you hear hoof prints or hoof prints, think of horses, not zebras. And basically that means if it looks like a congestive heart failure exacerbation, it smells like CHF, it probably is CHF. It's probably not some rare, really weird infectious disease or really weird unknown or previously unknown and unseen disease. It's if it, Occam's razor. Simplest answer is usually the most correct. So you'll probably hear a lot of that through clinicals when your professors are trying to teach you how to think reasonably and logically through your patient presentations, through what's going on with the patients and developing your differential diagnoses because those are more likely to be the, the correct ones unless you have someone really weird who's like, I've been out in the bush in Africa and I was in contact with all these sick people with Ebola and now I have a fever then you're probably gonna think Ebola, not the flu. However, not today. Today we're gonna to talk about the zebras, not the horses. So in order to talk about what is rare in emergency medicine, we'll first kind of touch on what kind of things you're gonna be doing all the time in the emergency department, whether you're a medical student or a resident or an attending physician kind of out on your own. And these are gonna be your abscesses, draining out big old balls of pus, which can be really satisfying, sending the patients home, doing simple lap repairs, someone cut their finger, someone cut their leg, putting some sutures, putting some staples in, letting them go. Slightly more exciting is your central line placement. These are the sick patients. This is why we go into emergency medicine. We like the sick people. We like having to make split decisions. We like having to put in central lines and doing stuff like intubations. And this is where we really feel like saving life. That's not to say that it isn't satisfying to get a reduction or to so a lack and send it home, but there's something far more satisfying in taking care of the sick patient and doing your procedures and getting them stable and getting them out of the ED. You'll also do fracture dislocations. Like I said, those tend to be pretty satisfying as well. Someone comes in with a broken arm, broken wrist, you sedate them, give them pain medication, pull on it, put it back in place, splint it, etc. Procedural sedations are fun, knocking people out. People have really fun reactions to some of the drugs we use for procedural sedations. So you'll get to see some interesting things. Had a gentleman once seen me operate while we were putting his shoulder back in. Had a little lady coming out of the OR sing A Silent Night on our way up. Um, so you'll get some pretty entertaining things. This is where all the videos about the dentist's office and getting wisdom teeth out get placed on YouTube with the people singing and ooing and aahing over their cast 15 times in a row. We also do a lot of lumbar punctures to rule out bleeding in the brain, to rule out meningitis, infections, all that stuff as well. We'll do <coughs> paracentesis, thoracentesis, so basically just sucking fluid out of the pleural cavity or out of the belly to look for signs of infection, look for signs of blood. You'll do it on inpatient floors as well to look for signs of malignancy. And those are also pretty quick and easy exams and, and studies that we can do in the ED on a regular basis. And then lastly, my favorite, or one of my favorite procedures in the emergency room is always intubations. It's really satisfying to get a difficult airway, see the color change, know that you're in the right spot, and have someone's oxygen level start to pop up. So usually by your intern year in an ED, you'll probably at least have 70 to 100 intubations. So that's another very, very frequent procedure that, that you'll do and get used to. Now one of the biggest issues that my residents talk to me about as they're getting ready to graduate is will they be comfortable with and will they be able to handle these zebra procedures when they come into the ER because we don't see them very often. Like I said, a lot of us will see them only about once or twice in our entire lifetime of practice. And for some people that can be 20, 30, 40, 50 years. <coughs> so these can be super rare. However, it also kind of depends on whether you're a white cloud or a black cloud. You'll notice as you get into practice and you get into med school that you and your colleagues will start to develop reputations where you're on call or you're, you're doing your shift at the hospital 
and you get the crazy three CPRs that come in, and you got to see an intubation and a central line, and someone died while on the CT scanner. It was all very exciting and fun and adrenaline rushing and very cool. And then you'll have the friend or maybe yourself who's like, I slept my entire trauma call. There was not a single thing that came in. So people kind of develop different streaks of luck. And uh, that'll help affect how many of these kind of rare procedures you see. I have friends who've seen several of, of certain ones that we'll go over and then others who've seen none. So I'm gonna try and present kind of these four zebra procedures on a basic case format to try and keep it a little bit interesting. I'll throw out a couple questions. I don't need the specific medical terms. You can use as simple words as you want. I'm not looking for anything particularly specific <coughs> other than, than simple stuff, kind of the obvious. So we'll start with our first case. And you're working in the ER, maybe a third year medical student, your first rotation in the ER, really excited. Your resident sends you to come see this little 82 year old man. So you go in and you talk to him, he's on a backboard, he's got a seat collar on him, that's brought him in. And he says, yeah, you know, I was walking through the house and when I went from the kitchen to the carpet, my cane stuck, kicked the, the carpet where it switches from the linoleum and I fell forward and I hit my eye on my cane. And he tells you that his eye feels really swollen, it feels really painful, and he used to have 20-20 vision in both eyes, but now he can't see a darn thing out of that eye. And in reality, when you're talking to this person, you're gonna get a lot more information about what happened and other complaints and injuries that he has. But for the sake of this lecture, we're gonna stay very simple and focus just on the topics that I want. So who can tell me something that's wrong with this picture here? You know, just shout it out. It's bloody. <laughs> a lot of blood, a lot of blood around the eye. Does it look puffy to anyone? Yes. Yeah. Does he have a lot of bruising around the eye as well? Yeah. Yes. Does it look like the eye's maybe sticking out a little bit compared to the other one as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know how many of you were here as second years and were able to see <coughs> my head and neck trauma lecture last year. But a big thing in medicine and imaging and physical exam is symmetry. So one of the easiest ways that you can look at imaging, that you can look at the patient and try and come up with something that's wrong is looking for symmetry. So on this guy, lucky for us, he's got two eyes. There's a lot of differences between the right eye and the left eye that you can look at and say, hey, something there probably doesn't seem too cool. So what this patient has is a retrobulbar hematoma. What that is is a fancy word for bleeding behind the eyeball. It is a medical and ophthalmologic emergency because when you get too much blood, it pops the eyeball out against the ligaments that hold it in place. And all that blood back there and all the increased pressure can squeeze down on the optic nerve and you can actually become totally blind if you don't do our first zebra procedure on a patient like this. So you go in to see this patient, you notice that their eye looks like it's bulging out a little bit. Call that proptosis. They've got a lot of subconjunctival hemorrhage, a lot of bruising around the eye. And you notice when you flash your pen light in the eye, because one of the easiest parts of a physical exam is to flash a pen light in someone's eye, that that pupil's not gonna constrict like it would if you shined it in your own eye. So you're a little bit concerned, you're like, eh, I don't really know what's going on. And you talk to, say you're a first year resident, you don't think to talk to your attending right away. You send the patient for a CAT scan. If you notice on the CAT scan, again, we're looking for symmetry, and this is, on, this is a left-sided eye, so please be aware that it's not the right that we're technically talking about in the case. You'll notice that, let's see if I have a mouse, where the arrows are going, there's some kind of fluffy, streaky white stuff that you don't see on the other eye. There's none of that extra fluffy, streaky white stuff. So you notice that, hey, that's not symmetric. There's probably something going on there. You'll notice, too, <coughs> that the way the eyes are sitting out from the face, it is also a little asymmetric and thicker on this side. So again, hey, probably something going on there. And at this point in your careers, you'll probably wow people as you start in third years, just being able to look for symmetry and say, hey, I don't know what this is, but it looks abnormal to me. So he goes off, he gets a CT scan, you come back and talk to the attending and tell him all this stuff and your attending freaks out a little bit and goes, oh my God, I haven't done a lateral canthotomy except for on pigs or cadavers in med school. What the heck do we do? So for a retrobulbar hematoma, the procedure that we do in the emergency room is called a lateral canthotomy and cantholysis. 
Basically, the point behind it is to go in and release some of the ligaments that keep the eyeball in place, set inside your head. And what that does is it allows the eye to pop out even more and gives it some room to decompress that pressure so that you have time to go to the operating room with ophthalmology and hopefully save their eyesight. So there's a lot of words on here. The only two places that I really want you to kind of pay half attention to are the ones with the big orange arrows. And that's your superior cura and your inferior cura. And these are the ligaments on the lateral side of the eye that hold the eyeball in place. These are gonna be what you do the cantholysis on. And you release them to let that eyeball pop out a little bit more. So, freaking out, you're gonna figure out how to do this lateral canthotomy that your attending hasn't done in forever. What kind of stuff do you need? You need a, basically a lac tray. It has mostly everything you'll need. You'll need lidocaine with epinephrine to help numb them up when you cut up all these ligaments and when you cut the skin. The epinephrine will help it keep from bleeding. You need a, the syringe and needle to draw it up and dispense the lidocaine. You need a scalpel and suture scissors, and you also need a hemostat. I didn't include that in there, but you need a hemostat as well. And all of that should be in a standard lac tray in any emergency room. So it's very easy to get. You'll probably be doing lacs all day long to the point that you're tired of them. So you'll be able to very easily go grab all your supplies. So the one thing I will say is if you see a patient and suspect retrobulbar hematoma, please don't send them for a CT scan or wait to go talk to an attending or, or a colleague or when you're out on your own. This is, like I said, it's a medical and it's an ophthalmologic emergency. So this procedure needs to be done before they go to CT scan. And your ophthalmologist specialists need to be called immediately. So this is a... Lateral canthotomy. So this is on a cadaver. You notice he's going to the lateral side of the eye, which is where we said that those crura are, that superior medial. And in a live person, what you're going to do is you're going to pinch that skin with a hemostat for about a minute to squish all the blood out, which is what he's doing now. So he's injected the lidocaine. Now he's pinching down to compress all the blood vessels, kind of decrease the bleeding. Obviously, this is a dead man. He's not going to bleed for this particular procedure. But in a live person, it's going to bleed and ooze, and it'll annoy you if you don't do what you can to kind of keep it from bleeding. So now he's compressed it. It's got lidocaine. He's using scissors to kind of dissect down to the bone on that side. And what that does is it exposes those crura. It gives you the opportunity to get into them and find them and cut them so that eyeball can pop out and decompress. So he's cut open the side of the eye just a little bit. And now he's sticking the scissors kind of down towards the inferior portion of the eye and flicking it against the, the inferior infralateral portion of the eye to try and find the rubber band tension of that inferior cura. And when he finds it, it really does feel a little bit kind of like a tense rubber band. You're just going to snip through it. And that'll release most of the pressure in the eye. Usually when you're doing these kinds of procedures, all you have to do is the inferior one. However, if the inferior one doesn't release enough pressure, then you take some rat tooth forceps and you do the same thing superiorly. Kind of dissect up enough so that you can use your tips of the scissors and find that superior cura and release that as well. And ideally, when you've done this, procedure correctly, the intraocular pressure in the eyeball will go down and the patient will have improved vision over the next 10, 15, 20 minutes to an hour. And so if you go in and all you do is that inferior portion, if they're not getting better within a couple minutes, that eye pressure doesn't go down. You use a tonal pen to kind of tap the eyeball and check what the pressure is. Then you go back in and you cut that superior cura. And hopefully that's all bought you enough time for the ophthalmologist to come in and have a more definitive treatment for this guy's eyeball. So luckily you get through that lateral canthotomy and cantholysis pretty easily. Hopefully it doesn't bleed very much but hopefully it bleeds a little bit because if they're dead, then you've got other problems going on. <laughs> All right. Any questions about the lateral canthotomy or triple bar hematoma? How, do they put it back together in surgery after? Yeah, okay. so they'll decompress it when the swelling's gone down. They'll do cosmetic repair and, okay. and get that all put back together. Is that opto or is that plastic that does that? Opto okay. does it. Is there a trick to keeping the patient still with one Meds. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, trick, obviously. yeah. We have lots of good drugs. You know, the lidocaine is going to make it so they don't feel it as much. 
So lidocaine doesn't take away all the feeling, it just makes you feel pressure instead of pain. So you've still got a patient who can see your hands with his good eye moving kind of around his face, which may make him a little nervous, in which case give him something for some anxiety to help him <coughs> still. But the good news is, if they have this issue, they can't see at all through that affected eye. So they won't be able to see you going straight at them with a pair of scissors or anything else, which I don't know about you guys, but that freaks me out, just have, being completely healthy. How close do you need to get to the eye for the lidocaine injection? So you're going straight through the skin. So a lot of times what I do, even when I'm doing lacerations or uh, incisions and drainage, I will bend the needle. So it comes in a pretty package, completely straight, and I'll bend it so that I don't have to hold the syringe at really funky angles. And you're basically just going horizontally into the skin, because the skin is what you're cutting. So, yeah? In case you presented the guy who's still on his cane, so how come this doesn't happen more So the airbag is going to hit a broader portion of your face, so you're more likely to have facial fractures than to just have an isolated issue with the eye, but you could have this in a car accident as well. Uh, the cane I just happen to choose, it's, it's not a picture that's from a specific case, but it's an isolated trauma so that hopefully we wouldn't get too sidetracked on all the other stuff that could potentially be going on with them, because if it was an MBC or a car accident, they'd have a lot of other issues going on that you could probably be addressing at the same time. So trying to keep it as, as simple as we can to kind of get through the, the cases. And as you advance in your clinical training and get through med school, you're gonna start seeing more cases and learning more how to deal with kind of multiple issues and deal with trauma and that sort of stuff. <coughs> but for today, we're, we're staying as simple. Anyone else? All right. So moving on to our second case. Now you've been working in the ED for maybe two months, you're an intern. You go to see your next patient that the nurse brings back and comes and looks at you and she's, she's got that look on her face that's like, what the hell, doc, you need, you need to get in here. So you wander in and you first thing you see from the door is this face. So without reading anything about the case, who's concerned about this, this face? <laughs> Why? Can she breathe? Yeah. <laughs> that is an excellent question and that is your first concern. When you do BLS, when you do ACLS, all that other stuff, your first concern is airway. And we have a very big concern for that airway because that tongue is bigger than her cheek. So you get a little bit of history. She's kind of nodding, and she's got her husband there. She's talking to you, and they say, yeah. About an hour ago, they noticed her lips and her tongue started to a little bit. And then on the way here, it just boom, blew up like a balloon. You know, they say, no, she hasn't had any meds. She hasn't had any chemical exposures, no foods that she doesn't already eat every day at home. Nothing else that would be super concerning for an allergic reaction. She says she doesn't have any allergies. This has never happened to her before. <clears throat> but as you're talking to her and you're getting a medical history, which you should do for any good patient interaction, because that's relevant to what might be going on and how you pick out your differential diagnoses, they do tell you that the only medication she's on is a blood pressure medication that she's been on for several years without any issue. Does anyone, have you guys done pharmacology at all yet? Doesn't ACE inhibitors increase angioedema? Yep. Hereditary angioedema. Mm -hmm. So, what's the end? Do you know the ending for ACE inhibitors that'll tell you it's an ACE inhibitor? Um, they're prills. Oh, prills, yeah. Yeah, they're prills. So, lisinopril, captopril, and allopril, and those medications. So, she's on lisinopril, but she's taken it for four years, never had an issue until today. Would you see the same thing with uh, angiotensin receptor blocker? You can, it's a lot more rare. Okay, so it's the ACE same thing with the dry cough that ACEs can cause as right. well. It, ARBs are similar enough that they can cause kind of similar issues. But I've personally never seen an angioedema with an ARB, but I know it has happened very rarely in the literature. So the one thing to know about the ACE inhibitors in angioedema is we don't know why it happens. It's not a classic allergic reaction. People can be on this medication for a week and have angioedema. They can be on this medication for four years, 10 years, 20 years, and all of a sudden have this kind of <coughs> So we don't really know why it happens. It doesn't really respond to your typical anaphylactoid medications. So your EpiPens, your steroids, your Benadryl, doesn't respond to all that stuff. We hit them with it anyway because, hey, if it's not an ACE inhibitor angioedema and it is anaphylaxis, Yay, it worked, and now maybe you don't have to do them. But if it doesn't, you still gotta be prepared with how to deal with it. So, 
Ideally, when you have a patient come in with angioedema like that, you are concerned about the airway. Typically what we do is we'll pop a camera on a, on a long bronchoscope or a nasopharyngoscope, and we'll go down and look at the back side of the tongue. We'll look at the cords to say, hey, is this all anterior? Is this just tongue? Or is this actually involving the cords? Is this an imminent airway disaster? So obviously, you don't want to do a zebra procedure as your first line of defense in treating people. You would try and get an airway in a more conventional manner before you get to this particular zebra procedure. And whether the oral swelling is not impressive enough that you can go in and get a, a normal intubation and squeeze an ET tube in through the cords that way, or whether you need to go in through the nose with a long camera and do a fiber optic, that is going to be your first option because obviously if you don't have to cut someone, you don't want to cut someone. There's a lot more complications involved with cutting through the neck. There's bleeding involved if you do a crike, and it can be just messy, and they usually have to go in for revisions and have other sorts of issues. So you go in with your, you see this tongue, you run out of the room, you go grab your attending, bring them back in, and you guys realize, oh crap, this is the real deal. We need to start setting stuff up. So you set stuff up, you call anesthesia or whatever other people you have available to help you with kind of difficult intubations to bring their equipment to try and look through the nose. And you realize you guys can't see the vocal cords. You can't get a good view down there. You have no idea where to pass the tube. It's just not working. And you sedated this patient a little bit with a medication that isn't going to depress their respiratory drive called ketamine. But you notice that their oxygen levels are slowly starting to drop. So now you've got a lot of swelling. They're maybe not as easy to back valve mask and ventilate without an airway. You have to do something to secure that airway. Because if you can't breathe, you're going to die. And that's bad. We try, we try and keep our patients from, from dying. So your last line of defense in an airway is going to be your crike. So this is, again, kind of one of the rock star procedures. Everyone's always super excited. Oh, there's a crike going on. I had one last April, and I think we had every single resident in the ER in the room with us just to watch and be in there and try and help. So it's pretty rare. It's fun. It's satisfying <coughs> sticking an airway in there. So can it oxygenate? Your patient's oxygen saturations are dropping, you've got to get them in airway, and you've got to get them fast. There's two airways that you can do through the neck. The one that we do in the ER is the cricothyroidotomy. That's kind of the down and dirty, quick procedure to get an airway in place. It's not a long-term airway. It is your, oh shit moment, we got to do this airway. Now, if you have surgery at the bedside, or say you're in a trauma and someone, you can't get an airway on someone with that, a lot of times they'll do a bedside trach, which is the more permanent version and they'll go down lower. The issues with that is that those bleed a lot more and you have your recurrent laryngeal nerve down there as well. So it takes a little bit more of a delicate hand and a lot more comfort with what you're doing to do than just a crank. So you see the patient when you came in, that tongue looks pretty awful. One of the first things you're gonna do while you're setting up to try and do your conventional intubation is you're gonna look at the neck anatomy because that's gonna tell you where to go if part of my language shit hits the fan and you've got to cut on this person. So if you look at the, the illustration, you'll see they kind of show the epiglottis up here, and they show the thyroid cartilage you can feel, and then they show your cricoid cartilage. So if you kind of feel on yourself, you can feel your hyoid bone a little up towards the top of that bony prominence, and then you can drop down, and there's a little kind of horseshoe scoop, and that's your cricoid cartilage down there. You're going to go in the soft stuff right above it, between the bone and there, and that's going to be your landmarks. So on people who are relatively skinny, those are pretty easy landmarks to find. On someone who's maybe 400 pounds, you'll be lucky if you can figure out where the neck begins and where the body begins. But taking a look, having some sort of familiarity, knowing where you're going to cut if you need to is going to be important. It's going to make you a lot more comfortable if this angioedema case comes down to a crack because you prepared for it. I can't say enough how important it is to think through all of your options whenever you're doing a procedure, whenever someone sick comes in. If this doesn't work, then what? If this doesn't work, then what? Because if you're prepared for the worst and you know what you're going to do, and if your staff is, everything's going to go a thousand times more smoothly than if you didn't talk about the possibility of a crike and it ended up coming up and you have nothing together and the nurses weren't aware that you were going to go with this and all of a sudden you're cutting and there's blood and oh god, oh god, oh god. So prepare ahead and prepare your staff ahead. When I had the crank uh, with one of our senior residents last year, he had really bad swelling, almost as bad as that. I mean, just dripping blood because his capillaries were rupturing. We thankfully had enough time to medicate him and get all of our equipment ready until the patient was going on. 
and go over with the nursing staff and respiratory therapy multiple times. This is the plan, this is what we're gonna do. If this doesn't work, this is what's gonna happen. If this doesn't work, this is what's gonna happen. And if finally, if this doesn't hurt, we're cutting. And so they were comfortable with it when it came down and we had to drop them and cut. Everyone was ready, nobody freaked out. So you got everything ready, you did your landmarks, you guys tried to do the fiber optic intubation, it didn't work, you couldn't see anything down there. Oxygen levels dropping, you gotta go. What do you need? What's gonna make you successful in your cricothyroidotomy? Well, when it comes down to it, you can have all sorts of fancy kits and trach tubes and all this stuff. All you really need, if you need to secure an airway, is a scalpel, a 6 0 puffed ET tube, and a bougie. And a bougie is a long plastical flat plastic flexible implement that can help us get airways. It's very bendy <coughs> and it, when you're in the trachea and the little tip of it will kind of clip along the wings and tell you where you are. And so you guys will probably, as, again, as you go on and as you enter emergency medicine residency, you'll talk about all sorts of different procedures to getting a trach or a crank and doing it quickly. But this bougie crank is personally my favorite. It was actually designed by the military for their field medics out on the front lines in order for them to be able to do a crike in the dark completely by feel. In which case, it's nice that obviously in the military you have to be in good physical condition because in the dark you have to be able to feel your landmarks when you cut. So, for your bougie crike. Again, this is a dead patient. There's not all that many people who do an emergency crike and to have a camera on hand to videotape it, mostly because all of us are trying really hard not to pee our pants. So, he's going over right now all of the equipment that you need. And as it pans down, unless he's got the scalpel that he's lifting up right now, he's got a 6 0 endotracheal tube that's cuffed, so it blows up with air, so it'll slide out, and the syringe to put the air in there. Anytime you intubate, you're always going to want to make sure that balloon doesn't have a balloon in or pop because you're going to have to exchange that. That yellow plastic thing there, that's your bougie. It's got a little curved coude tip that helps you direct it in the right direction. And then the back valve mask is what you're gonna use to ventilate the patient before and after the crank. So either through the back valve mask or through the actual place trach. So right now he's feeling, obviously this is a, a skinny cadaver. He's talking about those landmarks that we just went over, that bone prominence, that kind of U-shaped cartilage and feeling for that soft part in between where you're gonna go for this procedure. So if you don't quite know where those landmarks are, if you have that really obese patient, what you're gonna end up doing is a long vertical incision so that you can get your fingers in there and palpate the land for landmarks without all the fat on top. But on people like most, most of you guys and, and me, we, you'd be able to feel it through the skin so you can do a much smaller horizontal incision. So he's got his finger over the cartilage where he's gonna do his incision. So he's place marked it. And he's talking right here about the vertical incision if you have no idea where your landmarks are and you're just, you gotta cut it open and figure out what you're doing underneath. So you're gonna hold your spot over that, that cartilage and you're gonna go in with the scalpel and talk a lot. So in his case, as he's doing this, he's going through the skin and through the cartilage with one incision. There are some people that you're not gonna be able to go that deep. So you'll incise through the skin and then you'll kind of retract the skin away so that you can see better and then you will do another incision through the cartilage. In this lady's case, she's super skinny and he was able to do it just in one go. Once you're through the skin and through the cartilage, you put a placeholder in place. For him, he's using his finger. You can also just use the scalpel. We have the retractor, or we have the disposable scalpels in the ED that we use. So a lot of times what I prefer to do when I'm teaching and talking about this procedure is once you get through the cartilage, I just shove the sheath uh, over the blade and then turn the scalpel sideways and it acts as sort of a, a little retractor and opener for you that you can slide the bougie neck through. So that yellow thing again is the bougie. If you can tell at the top of the screen, that tip there is a little bit curved. So you've made the incision through the skin, you've made the incision through the cartilage. Obviously there's gonna be bleeding that's not on this dead person that there will be in real life. And there can be a, lot, a decent amount of bleeding. The neck is, has got a lot of vasculature, so you need to be prepared for that and have suction. 
but it generally shouldn't be a huge bloodbath if you're doing it the right way and not making your incision too big. So you're gonna insert the bougie curved tip towards the legs and through the hole, through the cartilage. And as you advance it, you'll be able to feel it click over the, the tracheal rings, over that cartilage. And you'll know you're in the right spot and it'll stop when it gets to the carina. So a couple centimeters in, maybe no more than five centimeters, give or take. You advance it down until it hits the carina and you know you're in the right spot. That's the airway, that's, the, that's where you wanna be. And he's just showing you the, about the distance that you're gonna be into, into the trachea through your incision. So it goes in, you can feel it clicking, you know you're in, you're happy, you're like, okay, we're almost done. Last couple of things that you do, leave the bougie in place. I would probably keep a hand on it because in the chaos of doing procedures like this, people are moving around, people are bumping the patient, it could fall out. Keep a hand on it, slide that into a tracheal tube over the bougie. And I would recommend putting a little bit of lube around the balloon so it slides in a little bit easier. The blood will lubricate it a little bit, but as you can tell, it takes a little bit of manipulation to get all the way all the way in. And you don't have to advance that cuff very far. You just have to get it completely through the skin and through the cartilage because if you go too far, you can do a main stem intubation and then only half the lung is receiving the oxygen that it needs. So he's in place. He inflated the balloon that he checked earlier. He knows there's no leaks in there, that it's not going to collapse on him. He places his BVM onto the ET tube and that's a color emitter. If it if you're properly oxygenating in the right spot, it'll turn from yellow to purple when there's CO2 that comes back. And that'll help confirm you're in the right spot as well. So now he took this angioedema patient that he couldn't get an airway on, cut through the neck, located the airway, placed the ET tube, and now he's able to oxygenate. You'll take some umbilical tape or whatever thing you have available in the ER to kind of MacGyver to hold that ET tube down, because obviously, when they're taking this person to the MICU, when they're eventually going to the operating room to exchange this for a trach, you don't want that thing to move because it was a pain in the butt to get there. You don't want to have to do it again. So real quick, he's just showing that you can also do this if you don't have an ET tube or you don't want to use an ET tube. You can use an actual trach that we call a shiny. So it's a much smaller device because obviously you don't have to go through the nose or the mouth, down the throat, and into the trachea. So it's much shorter, and it's the same exact principle. You just slide it straight over the bougie, slip it through the skin, and push it flush. The one thing I will say about Crikes, again, they're bloody. Make sure you secure everything down. Make sure you have everything ready as well, and just try not to panic. And that's one of the worst things you can do. It's, it's simple anatomy. Make sure your incision's wide enough to get your finger through and the ET tube. If you do a little teeny tiny incision like that, you're not going to get any to be at least over a centimeter. So if you're comfortable, and a lot of you will be by the time you get to residency and through most of your clinicals, you'll be able to eyeball distances. So you'll be able to look at a lap and say, hey, that's about four centimeters, or hey, that's about two centimeters. So if you get comfortable with that, you'll know, you know, I need about a centimeter and a half incision to get everything through there, because otherwise you're gonna be sitting there jamming at somebody's throat with a wall that's bleeding, causing more trauma while you're freaking out. So that's a bougie crank. There's a bunch of other techniques to do it. You can do it with Seldinger technique by putting in a little catheter and a guide wire and all sorts of other more complicated stuff. But this is my favorite. This is the simplest, it's the fastest. Like I guess it was designed so you could do it in the dark. So I prefer to keep things simple when stuff's going badly because it, it means there's less room for other things to go badly. Any questions about it, Craig? Uh, when you mentioned pre preparing, is that just like you just palpate to see if you can find the air, or do you mark it just in case or anything like that? So I will mark it, actually, unless it's somebody who's really easy to palpate on that you're going to find it immediately. A yeah. lot of these people with angioedema, unfortunately, they aren't the super skinniest of people. And so it might, especially when you're panicking and trying to, to get stuff done, reach for things, you might lose your landmark. So a lot of times I'll just I'll mark the thyroid cartilage and I'll make the cricoid so I know exactly where to go. And if I'm doing an airway like this where I think it might go down to a cric, I'll actually put betadine on the neck so that it's disinfected and prepped and ready and I'll have everything out on the table ready to go so just in case. And like I said, I make sure that all of my staff is, knows that it could get to this. And I do the same thing with any trauma or 
with any medical intubation to. I make the resident run through, okay. What's your first pass attempt? If that doesn't work, then what are you gonna do? If that doesn't work, then what are you gonna do? Who's your backup? I'm your backup. What happens if I can't get it? All the way down to the end to the prep because again, it makes an immense difference in whether, and how comfortable everyone is and whether people are freaking out and throwing stuff and knowing where everything is if you prepare not only yourself, but everyone else. Thank you. Any other questions on Craig? How much you miss? Um, you know, so you talked about with the bougie being able to feel the, the, the bumps of the rings, but if, if the bougie's going in, where else might you be other than the tree? So if you didn't check any of your landmarks and you went, say, way lateral, it's somebody with a big fat neck or torticollis or something, you could be lateral to it. I don't know that I've heard of anything where somebody's been so gung-ho that they've stabbed straight through the trachea and into the esophagus, but never say never, because that right lays right underneath it. But if you're dead center and you're in the right spot, it's going to be really hard to miss. You know, the, the big, the more likely at times when you will miss is when it's just somebody who's ridiculously obese, and that's why they recommend the vertical incision so that you can dig your fingers in there and find your landmarks, even if you don't know exactly what level it is because their neck is, you know, yay big. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Move on to our second to last case. So you're working in the ER, it's the middle of the night, it's been pretty slow, so you guys, you and your attending and your co-resident just been kind of joking around, having fun. And all of a sudden, you hear from triage, you know, we're bringing, we're bringing back a CPR, we're bringing back a CPR. So the only thing you get from triage is that there's a young lady who would come in with some chest pain, she's got a known history of CHF, you've actually seen her a couple times in the past. And but not within the past eight or nine months. They bring her back, they're doing compressions on the stretcher, and you notice something that looks very obvious. So she's pregnant. Uh-oh. So Dr. if you've got someone with witness. Real quick, we have like 10 minutes left before the next lecture okay. starts. Just um, yeah. um, Pre-mortem C-sections are done within four to five minutes of a witness cardiac arrest. Once the baby has been in there during CPR for more than four to five minutes, their survival rate tanks. Um, and you do it only on people with abundance above the umbilicus. So 20, above the umbilicus is about 24 weeks. Ideally, you want at least 28 weeks. Uh, if it's a medical code, a lot of times just getting the baby out will make it more likely to save the mom. So you can probably save both of them. If it's a trauma, you're probably just bringing the, the baby out. So you need a scalpel, some bandage zipper, scissors, a diaper for you. A neonatal resuscitation equipment thing, and hopefully it'll be gone. Thank you. For a perimortem C-section, this is a down and dirty procedure, you're gonna zipper them up. Stem to stern, you want every possible chance to get that baby out of there as quickly and safely as possible. So xiphoid to pubis, done, quick all the way down. And then you're gonna cut through all the musculature. You're gonna get down and you're gonna expose the uterus, the most inferior portion of the uterus, you'll use a scalpel just to get in through the muscle. And then you're gonna swap the scalpel out for a pair of scissors and cut all the way up so that you have the biggest exposure for the baby. And then you're gonna pull the baby out. Obviously, you want to try not to cut the baby, but if the baby has a little nick on its back, that's not a big deal compared to dead. So that's a pretty more C-section. I have had one friend who did it on the side of the road in an ambulance um, after a helicopter call. Baby survived for about two days, but it's that's another one of those oh shit procedures where if you have to do it, you're going to be freaking out because I mean you are just splaying this woman open and it's tearing up baby. Um, our last case, real quick. So you've got a 33-year-old guy. He was just wandering around minding us in business, and these two dudes shot him. You guys said, yeah, he's on scene, he's talking, he's doing fine, he's got a gunshot wound to his chest. We're coming in, he's saturating fine. And then you're waiting for, this has been trauma activated, you're chit-chatting with the trauma team, sitting outside the, the trauma bay, and EMS rolls in and they are doing compressions. So, for an ED thoracotomy, I've seen several of these in my lifetime. It's Usually done on penetrating trauma. There's about a seven to eight percent chance of survival for penetrating trauma to the chest for ED thoracotomy. You can also do it for witness loss of pulses in blood trauma, but it's not as uh, effective. And you probably want a trauma surgeon in house who can go in and definitively fix this once you open them up. So you need a thoracotomy tray, which will have all your fun goodies on it. You might use a Foley catheter to clog, clog up any holes in the heart in order to get time to go to the OR, um, sutures, etc. So a lot of times you're gonna go on the side of the heart, mid-axillary line, you're gonna do a big old incision, insert with spreaders, deliver the heart. People like saying that for whatever reason. Uh, 
and this is the last thing. I'll just play the video real quick. So they've splayed them open. They're using scissors right now. They did an initial scalpel incision all the way around to expose the outside of the chest. And now they're using scissors to kind of cut through all the musculature there and get everything exposed. You'll notice they're doing CPR through all of this. Those are the rib spreaders that they're trying to jam on in there and get into place. And this is all stuff that you should ideally be able to do in about a minute or two. Just bam, slice them open, get those rib spreaders in because you're still doing compressions. You know, she's having trouble but like, getting that in there, having to get a little bit more exposure, getting the rib spreaders in, still getting the rib spreaders in. Now they've finally got some exposure there and they're pulling out the heart. And that's so that you can take a look at the heart, you can look for any signs of bleeding, signs of cardiac activity, so that you can put the cardiac paddles on and you can shock, deliver direct, shock directly to the heart. You can repair any lacerations in the heart or around it, and you can also get a clamp and cross clamp the aorta and preserve some blood flow to the heart. So these are your, again, your open thoracotomy indications. Typically, the big thing is going to be penetrating all into the chest. Those are going to be what they survive most for. And it's very, very fast because this person is pretty much dead unless you're dumping blood and repairing what they've got going on. So this dude was a blunt drum on the motorcycle. So, cracked him open. This guy survived the OR and then he died. So that's it. Those are the zebra procedures. <laughs> Thank you.